Joe had a gentle, warm personality. Fuchida liked him immensely. Joe also had a good record in naval aviation as pilot, student and teacher, and his devotion to the throne touched Fuchida. He was so loyal to the emperor, said Fushida, that he wanted to lead the first special attack personally. But Fuchida didn't care much for Joe's idea. Such a special attack force would of necessity be small, hence not overly effective. Further, he didn't believe that Japan's young pilots were yet capable of executing specialized strikes successfully. Not that he doubted their courage. Japanese Navy pilots were not afraid. They would die willingly, but if they were to die, it could not be in vain. Ready to spend men but not to throw them away, Fuchida temporarily pigeonholed the idea. Joe was not the only Japanese naval officer thinking in terms of suicide, attacks. Credit for originating what would be the OK bomb is generally given to Ensign Shoichi Ota of the Naval Air Technical Depot, who began to work on the idea of making himself a human bomb around the summer of 1944, when the Marianas campaign had taken a turn extremely unfavourable to the Japanese. Fuchida next heard of the special attack concept early in August, when he received personal letter from veteran fighter pilot Captain Motoharu Okamura, a friend of long standing. He had preceded Fuchida by three classes at Etajima, and they often pulled duty together aboard carriers before Pearl Harbor. The start of the war found Okamura instructing the Yokosuka Air Corps. He was a lot like Murata, a friendly, easygoing type who liked fun, recalled Fuchida. He had a great sense of humour, was always laughing and cracking jokes. Okamura wrote from Katori Air Base, where he commanded a fighter group under Vice Admiral Kimpei Teraoka. His letter didn't go into detail about the organisation or formation of a special attack force. He simply proposed the establishment of what he called a Hornet Corps Mitsubachi Butai, which he wanted to command. He explained that when the Hornet attacks, he dies, but so does his enemy. His mind already fertilised by Joe's suggestion, Fuchida decided that Okamura's idea had merit. He took the letter to Toyoda and Kusaka. What are your opinions? he asked. Neither expressed a thought in words. They looked first at each other, then at Fushida, and slowly nodded their heads. A less than enthusiastic response, but one he took for approval. Letter in hand, he set out for Imperial headquarters to consult with Gender and Suzuki. Both agreed that Okamura had a good idea. The Navy should put it into practice. The OK bomb went into production in September 1944. It was a small rocket glider with tiny wings and a cockpit and was attached to the bottom of a land-based bomber. The glider pilot rode with the mother plane crew until near the target area, then climbed down into the bomb. At the appointed time, the bomber released the missile. Its pilot steered it to his objective and to his own death. The glider had a cruising range of about 11 nautical miles, and its bomb load of some 2,600 pounds could sink a ship if directly on target. The trick to its effective use lay in the mothership's evading enemy defences to move in close to the target. The entire weapon, glider, bomb and pilot, was named OK, because the cherry blossom, which falls at the height of loveliness, has always been linked in Japanese symbology with the young warrior slain in battle. When General Headquarters decided to accept Okamura's idea, they appointed him commander of Katori Air Base. There he trained the pilots and crews in the use of the bomb. He also had under his wing the bombers to transport it and the fighter escorts. He fervently believed in his core of divine thunder, Jinrai Butai, and tackled the job with a passion. But because of his value to Japan's war effort, the Navy couldn't permit him to lead a mission. Shortly after the end of the war, Okamura shot himself in the head. Having sent so many young men to certain death, he felt that he must give his own life in final salute and atonement. The Japanese might have put the Oka into combat months before they actually did, on 21st March 1945, had the Americans not bagged 50 of them at one blow without knowing they had done so. The huge carrier Shinano, converted from a Yamato-type battleship, came down the ways on 19 November 1944. Ten days later, on her maiden voyage out of Yokosuka with 50 Oka bombs aboard, she ran afoul of the American submarine Archerfish, which slammed six torpedoes into her. She sank within a few hours. Oddly enough, the first organised utilisation of special attack air tactics in the Japanese Navy arose. 
not as a result of Project Marudai, the naval research effort to develop a suitable suicide bomb, but in the Philippines at the instigation of Vice Admiral Takijiro Onishi, who assumed command of the 5th Base Air Force on 20 October 1944. Onishi was another long-time associate of Fuchida's, a pioneer in naval aviation, and exactly the type of man to sponsor a tactic that depended for success more upon physical courage and self-sacrifice than upon skill or training. An ardent patriot, he believed that nothing was impossible to anyone who brought to his task sufficient spiritual determination. The day he arrived at Clark Field near Manila, 19 October, he proposed mass suicide tactics to his Zero pilots. With their tradition of honourable suicide, and fully understanding the urgencies of the situation, the pilots unanimously agreed. Thus was born the group Onishi named the Kamikaze Tokubetsu Kogekitai, after the typhoon that destroyed the Mongol invasion force in 1570. The first group of 23 petty officer pilots was under the command of Lieutenant Yukio Seki, a graduate of Etajima. Their aim was to obtain a hit with every attack. Fuchida explained the methodology. The special attack planes would approach the target from various altitudes, through gaps in the enemy patrol network. At times, flights would be made at high altitudes of about 6,000 metres, or this would be changed to altitudes from 500 to 1,000 metres, and at times, extremely low altitudes close to the surface of the water. However, in any case, the suicide plane would break through enemy fighters and defensive fire, approach its target at high speed and at an angle as steep as possible, crash and explode on its deck, or if this was impossible, into its side. Japanese propaganda boasted that every kamikaze sank a ship. This was wildly exaggerated, yet Onishi's men were successful enough to cause the US Navy serious concern. About one in four inflicted damage, one in 33 sank its target. The United States clamped a tight lid of censorship on the subject, lest the Japanese discover just how much damage the kamikazes were doing. It appeared that Japan had, in Admiral Morrison's words, sprung a tactical surprise that might prolong the war another year. Meanwhile, in the summer of 1944, the big question confronting combined fleet headquarters was where the Americans would strike next. To meet the threat as best they could, headquarters devised a plan called Operation Show. The plan was divided into four parts, each basically the same, differing principally in possible invasion locales. The Philippines, Taiwan, Nansei, Shoto, Southern Kyushu, Kyushu, Shokaku, Honshu, and Nokaido. Show means to conquer, but as Fuchida remarked, the plan might well have been called Operation Killer. For the objective was not victory. The strategy behind Show was to exact such a high price from the United States that it would end the war by a compromise. The Navy planned to concentrate on troop transports thus obtaining the highest ratio of loss of enemy life per round of Japanese ammunition. The hope was that some 100,000 US troops would be killed when their transports were hit and sunk. If this happened at one or more invasion points, the Japanese believed that public opinion in the United States might well pressure the government into stopping the sacrifice. The naval air tactics Fuchida worked out were founded on a refusal to commit aircraft in a hopeless duel with American carrier forces at sea. Instead, planes would concentrate on American transports offshore while they were still crammed with troops. An empty ship was no target, Fuchida later observed. We wanted each one full of soldiers so we could kill them all and make the United States feel the pain. Ugaki received a copy of Sho on 17 August. He confided to his diary. Whether the plan is adequate or not needs further study, but at the time when we have been driven to the last ditch, we have no other choice. Five days later, he remarked that fleet headquarters seemed to be taking things too easy, for no operational plan had been completed. Toyota's staff was far from idle. They worked on the Navy's own portion of show and coordinated with the Army, which would bear the brunt of ground combat against American landing forces. As Colonel Takushiro Hattori, former chief of the Army Department Operations Section of General Headquarters, stated, The point particularly borne in mind in drawing up plans for the operations was how to destroy the enemy landing forces. The first scheme was the use of air force to destroy enemy convoys, and the second was ground combat against landing forces. 
an imperial conference was held at the palace on 19 August to arrange for political backing of show. The policy that emerged had nothing whatsoever to say about forcing the Americans to the conference table. Instead, it proclaimed, by marshalling her existing fighting power and potential national strength which can be turned into fighting power by the end of this year, the Empire of Japan will defeat the enemy and crush his plan to continue the war, secondly, regardless of the success or failure of the plan stated above. And no matter how the international situation may change, the Empire of Japan intends to carry the war to a successful conclusion with her hundred million people, firmly united in unshakable confidence in her ultimate victory and protecting the imperial land. This represented the die-hard unrealistic army line, which the navy had somehow to counter. Its most potent weapon was Yonai, who wore two hats as vice premier and navy minister. Around the first part of September, Toyoda and top members of his staff, including Fuchida, consulted with Yonai. After listening carefully to their proposal, he replied in effect, If your show operation works well during the first American attempt at invasion, I can bring pressure to bear on the army for a compromise peace, and will not hesitate to do so. Thus encouraged, Combined Fleet Headquarters immediately arranged for war games in the Naval Staff College to acquaint all officers concerned with the new strategy and review in detail how to carry it out. Toyoda held the chair as supreme umpire. Those in attendance included Toyoda's staff and certain members of General Headquarters who acted the part of the American invaders. Among these representatives were Suzuki, whose path had crossed Fuchida's so often since their days together at Etajima, and Commander Yoshimor Terai, one of his good friends from Naval Staff College days. He came in place of Gender, whom he was scheduled to replace as Air Operations Officer in the near future. Most of the Air Fleet commanders attended the war games along with their staffs. Among them was Ozawa, who still commanded the carriers. Only one, the Zuikaku, was a major flattop. Of the others, the Chitose, Chioda and Zuiho, only the Chioda began life as a carrier, the other two being remodelled submarine tenders. Following the Marianas disaster, these four returned to Japan to be moored and camouflaged in the inland sea, each anchored separately near a small island thickly wooded with pine trees. Scrub pine and shrubbery concealed their flight decks. Two new sister carriers, the Unryu and Amagi, took to the seas early in August, but no naval pilots remained to man them. In opening the war games, Yonai spoke briefly on the problem of compromise peace and Operation show. His presence underlined the significance of the exercises. Although the Philippines were considered the most likely invasion target, the war games used Taiwan as the guinea pig. It was assumed that before this invasion, 12 American carriers would attack Kyushu, Honshu, Shikoku and the Philippines. Among other things, the attendees threshed out the problem of how to save land-based planes from enemy carrier strikes. They decided that the Navy should move as many as possible to Korea and Shikoku, there to hide the M in the woods and caves. They would also send a number to the Tokyo area. If the Americans raided the capital in force, these aircraft would shift to Hokkaido. Otherwise, the Japanese preferred not to send planes to Hokkaido, so remote from the center of operations. The war games assumed, too, that an attempted American invasion would follow hard upon the heels of the carrier strikes. This posed a problem. Despite the Navy's hope of sinking American troop transports offshore, some enemy forces would inevitably be able to land. They agreed, therefore, that the army must be reinforced to stop, or at least delay American landing parties while the naval air arm completed its destruction. Here, too, Fuchida remarked, the basic aim was to kill, kill, kill. He didn't fool himself into thinking that only American blood would flow. As he recalled, we Japanese too had to be prepared not only to be bloodthirsty killers, we all had to be ready to be killed. This not only meant the pilots who flew the planes, but all of the officers and men aboard all of the ships. Yes, even the ships themselves must become instruments of suicide attacks in order to exact the heaviest possible toll from the enemy. No doubt Yonai was sincere when he promised to put pressure on the army for a compromise peace, if Sho initially succeeded, but he didn't have the chance to make his word good. Indeed, the autumn of 1944 provided the Japanese Navy with a convincing demonstration of Murphy's Law. 
If anything can go wrong, it will. Periodically, the Pacific Fleet switched command and title between Spruance and Halse, although the fleets were structurally the same body. Halsey was in command when his carrier forces engaged the Japanese in what the latter termed Taiwan Oki Kokusen. On his way home from Manila, Fuchida, along with Toyoda and his assistant chief of staff, Rear Admiral Toshiten Takada, stopped on Taiwan for an inspection tour. He was deeply disturbed when the Japanese elected to give battle instead of dispatching their planes to Kyushu in accordance with the war games. Reports of ensuing Japanese aircraft losses vary from 500 planes to 143. Fuchida's estimate of 312 strikes the proverbial happy medium and exactly coincides with the official announcement. In any case, results were bad enough that Fuchida was in no position to celebrate, as he normally would have, when a promotion list of 15 October raised him and gender to the rank of captain. Undeterred by facts, the Japanese press proclaimed another great victory. On 19 October, the Asahi newspaper published its list of alleged enemy losses. Sunk, 11 carriers, 2 battleships, 3 cruisers and 1 destroyer. Damaged, 8 carriers, 2 battleships, 4 cruisers and 13 unidentified ships. The nation at large revelled in the news and the emperor expressed his satisfaction. But knowledgeable navy men such as Ozawa, victim of Spruance's turkey shoot, and Vice Admiral Takeo Kurita, Commander-in-Chief, Second Fleet, were sceptical. Back in Tokyo with Toyoda, Fuchida received material submitted by a knocker of the force involved. He studied and discussed this with Suzuki at General Headquarters and with the Combined Fleet's intelligence officer. He admitted even the most generous interpretation of the conclusion indicated that bomb damages were inflicted on just four aircraft carriers. After checking later radio intelligence, it appeared rather unlikely that any of them were sunk. Therefore, it was estimated that the enemy still had ten effective aircraft carriers. The naval general staff agreed, so when the first part of show went into effect on 17 October with the American landings on Suluan Island, the combined fleet warned subordinate air force units that the enemy task force was estimated to contain ten aircraft carriers in operating condition. Altogether, for the Japanese, this was an inauspicious prelude to the major battle that they called the Second Battle of the Philippine Sea, and which the Americans knew as the Battle of Leyte Gulf. Convinced that the enemy planned to invade the Philippines by way of Leyte, Toyoda activated Sho on 18 October. Roughly, participating Japanese naval forces were divided into three principal groups. Kurita headed the first striking force which in turn was divided into the center force under Kurita and the southern force under Vice Admiral S. Nishimura. The plan called for these two bodies to catch U.S. amphibians in later Gulf in a pincers movement. Meanwhile, the mobile force under Ozawa would sortie from home waters and lure Halsey's carriers north of the main scene of action. The idea of this decoy operation originated with Fuchida, who felt quite certain that Halsey could no more resist charging after four Japanese flat tops than a bull could ignore a matador's cape. Fuchida had difficulty selling the idea to Toyoda and Kusaka, but Captain Shigenori Kami, the new senior staff officer, backed him up. Later, Ozawa, the prospective cheese in this mousetrap, agreed with the concept. Despite his formidable first strike force, which included the Yamato, Musashi, five old battleships, eleven heavy cruisers, two light cruisers and nineteen destroyers, Kurita was pessimistic. Remembering Guadalcanal, he believed that the enemy transports would have to be destroyed completely. However, my opinion at that time was that in view of the difference in air strength of the opposing forces, our chance for a victory after the sortie would be about 50-50. I had also thought then that the aerial support would fall short of our expectations. Kurita's fears were well-founded. Leyte Gulf did for Japan's surface forces what the Battle of the Philippine Sea had done for the air arm. As it happened, Ozawa's decoy operation was fairly successful. Precisely as the Japanese hoped, Halsey thundered after Ozawa, whose carriers Zuikaku, Zuiho, Chitose and Chioda had only 116 aircraft among them. The hybrid Ise and Hyuga battleships partially modified as carriers had no planes aboard. Ozawa's force, without the strength to challenge the US carrier force effectively, suffered heavy losses. The four carriers, 
one light cruiser, three destroyers, an oiler, and all but 29 of his aircraft. He had done well to keep American fleet carriers away from the main action. Unfortunately for the Japanese, it was a wasted effort. Not realizing Kurita was facing Rear Admiral T.L. Sprague's famous taffy escort carriers instead of Halsey's mighty flat tops, he feared that to enter later Gulf Jong after the scheduled time would mean rushing into the enemy who had completed its defense and would only result in our becoming easy victims. So he reversed course, greatly to the relief of the Americans, for despite the beating he had potent firepower left. Forces under his command lost three battleships, including the Musashi, six heavy cruisers, three light cruisers, nine destroyers, a destroyer transport, and four submarines. Fuchida didn't speak about what the loss of Ozawa's four carriers meant to him, but of course their sacrifice was implicit in the mission. One suspects that, as a naval airman, he preferred to have them sunk by a worthy foe in a valiant effort rather than hide ignominiously in the inland sea. The situation was bad, 139 the 5th Fleet under Spruance would have been like a Pekingese challenging a Mastiff. On 16 February, Spruance's carrier aircraft attacked vast areas in the Tokyo region. This attack, and those of the succeeding few days, destroyed 150 Army and Navy planes on the ground, some hundred fighters rose to the defence, and about 40 were shot down. Through the latter part of February and early March, attention centred on Iwo Jima. Ugaki was worried and disgusted by the apparent ease of the landings, all very well to let the invaders land, then lure them inward. But that army plan had never succeeded. It had to be regarded as nothing but an excuse for being unable to beat the enemy at the seashore. The Japanese Navy had little to do with the defence of Iwo Jima, and its only air opposition of any note was put up on 21 February. Fifty planes hit Task Force 58, and four kamikazes and two bombs damaged the Saratoga sufficiently to send her back to Eniwetok for repairs. Kamikazes also sank the small carrier Bismarck Sea and slightly damaged the escort carrier Longa Point. The Navy did have a spectacular action on the drawing boards, another Operation Jan. This would deliver a crushing blow to the US task force after it had returned to its anchorage at Ulithi in the Carolines. It aimed not at defending Iwo Jima, but in delaying the anticipated action at Okinawa. If Tan succeeded, the Navy would use the time thus gained to rebuild its air strength. The Navy established Jan on 17 February, calling for a one-way attack with 24 land bombers. Hearing of a large concentration of US ships in Ulithi, the combined fleet ordered execution for 10 March. This was the sort of suicidal action that Ugaki loved, and he sent his men off with a ringing exhortation to carry out a dauntless attack. Toyoda also sent a message urging them to defend our sacred land by ramming yourself upon the enemy. These heroics were wasted. A reconnaissance flight over Ulithi on 12 March disclosed that more US carriers were there than before the mission, and there was no evidence of sunken ships. Tan had been a complete failure. Meanwhile, the United States had visited upon the Japanese homeland its single most disastrous bombing of the war, not excluding the atomic bombs. On the night of 9 and 10 March, Major General Curtis LeMay's B-29s used incendiary bombs to set mile after mile of Tokyo burning. The results, in the words of MacArthur's reports, were indescribably horrifying. Well over two fifty thousand houses were destroyed, rendering more than a million persons homeless, and 83,000 were burned to death. From that day forth, strategic bombing against the homeland ceased to be a dangerous nuisance and became a real threat to the nation's entire economy. Over a period of days in mid-March, an air engagement occurred, of which Fuchida thoroughly disapproved, but about which he could do nothing save express his opinion. On 17 March, the combined fleet received word that an American task force had left Ulithi on the 14th and was steaming north. Ugaki promptly began to prepare his 5th Air Fleet. Combined fleet headquarters at Hiyoshi discussed how best to cope with this threat, failing to reach an early conclusion. But the general trend seemed to be in favour of preserving our strength against them, Ugaki noted. This was in accordance with the agreed-upon strategy waste no aircraft against Mitch's carriers, save them for troop transports. However, such restraint was not in Ugaki's nature. He was a bit like Kakuta, Fuchida reflected. He was an attacking type, 
one who would take up the enemy's challenge no matter what the circumstances might be, and fight back. He was constitutionally and emotionally unable to hold his planes back and wait. Ugaki protested so vigorously that both the naval general staff and the combined fleet bent to his will, and, as Tomioka stated, adopted the improper policy of leaving the matter entirely to the discretion of the commander of the 5th Air Fleet. The result was predictable. Ugaki was no fool. He knew that in neither skill nor readiness were his forces fit to challenge a task force of the Spruance Mitscher type. For one thing, the 5th Air Fleet's planes had almost completely dis so most of them had to make night flights to reach their operational bases. Nevertheless, Ugaki told himself that, in the face of the anticipated massive attack, we would not be able to preserve our strength even if we tried to do so. I could not stand to see them destroyed on the ground. On 21st March, two groups of US carriers having been sighted, Ugaki decided that this provided the opportunity to test the usefulness of the OK of 55 scheduled escort zeros. Only 30 were available. Okamura and his staff protested that these were insufficient to break through the American screen of Hellcats. But Ugaki ordered off 18 land-based bombers, 16 of them carrying OKs. Then he retired to his underground operations to await results. All too soon he had a tragic report. A swarm of Hellcats had shot down every OK and 15 zeros within 10 minutes. Survivors of the four-day battle reported that the Japanese had sunk five carriers, two battleships, one heavy cruiser, two light cruisers, and one unidentified ship. Ugaki had sent out two 46 planes, including reconnaissance, and lost one 61-83% of his combat craft. Undismayed by this stunning statistic, Ugaki believed we gained a good mark in the operation. I was glad I did my duty. For a short time, the naval general staff and the combined fleet believed without a doubt that the 5th Air Fleet had sunk half of the enemy aircraft carriers. Then, Fuchida explained, doubts set in because of the loss of the OKs, and the fact that US radio showed no indication of confusion caused by continuous losses. So the combined fleet cut the estimate to four American ships sunk. Tomioka added, Although the naval general staff made a still more conservative estimate, and estimated about two ships sunk, it did not go so far as to believe that none had been sunk. That, however, was the case, although the Americans did suffer damage. Kamikazes hit the carriers Intrepid and Wasp, while conventional bombs struck the Enterprise, Franklin and New Yorktown. The Franklin suffered the worst damage, and only superb seamanship saved her. Ugaki's ill-considered action seriously hamstrung the Navy when, shortly thereafter, the Americans commenced the invasion of Okinawa. Indeed, Fuchida's friend Suzuki declared that the Navy would not be able to participate until May. However, others favoured a decisive air battle at Okinawa. At first, the Army and Navy concurred in all-out air operations at Okinawa. Then the Army decided to reserve a certain amount of air strength to defend the homeland. The Navy preferred to concentrate on stopping the enemy at Okinawa. With the first American bombing to soften up Okinawa, Toyoda dispatched Fuchida post-haste to Kanoya to direct General Headquarters air operations, and incidentally to keep a close eye on Ugaki lest he break out again. Fuchida had Toyoda's authority to speak in his name. From Kanoya he maintained direct telephone connections with both Toyoda and Kusaka. This time, therefore, when air attacks came from American carriers, conventional aircraft in the Kyushu area would be hoarded for use against transports. The main force to resist the Okinawa invasion consisted of the 3rd Air Fleet under Tereoka, Ugaki's Kamikazes, and the Army's 6th Air Division. The Japanese also had the 1st and 2nd Air Fleets under Fukudome and Onishi respectively, but these were on Taiwan and very weak. If Fuchida needed anything to convince him that Japan had lost the favour of heaven, the opening of the Okinawa campaign would have done so. At the very beginning, just as the Americans prepared to disembark, two events effectively cancelled the Navy's plan to destroy American troop transports in shallow water. First, the initial landings took place at Keramareto, a small island group nearby, instead of on the western side of Okinawa. Reports of the actual landing points arrived in Japan late. By the time the kamikazes reached the scene, the invaders had stormed ashore almost unopposed. Many suicide pilots wasted themselves against empty ships. 
Secondly, Lieutenant General Mitsuru Ushijima, commander of the 32nd Army on Okinawa, failed to follow the Joint Army-Navy Defense Agreement. According to this, the Army was to pen up the invaders on the beachheads to give the Navy time to slaughter them. Instead, Ushijima abandoned the coastal area and retired to the mountainous interior to dig in, which meant that the Navy could not carry out the kamikaze plan. Although the Japanese had nowhere near the 4,500 aircraft the plan had specified, those available inflicted considerable damage to American ships. However, it was not the type of damage the Navy hoped for. As one army officer observed, the plan to sink main portion of the enemy's transports before the enemy could land troops ended in a long-term attrition operation against enemy ships off Okinawa after the landings had been made. On the 5th of April, the Navy decided on a last-ditch surface action, Kaijo Tokotai. The name told its own story, Special Attack Unit being the official designation for any suicide group. In brief, this unit, under the 2nd Fleet's Commander-in-Chief, Vice Admiral Seiichi Ito, would consist of the Yamato, the cruiser Yahagi, and eight destroyers. As planned, the super battleship and her escorts would sail to the troop landing area at Okinawa and there run aground. From this unsinkable position, Ito would turn his flagship into a steel fortress that, with her huge guns and those of the other vessels, would blast American troop ships. This operation was the brainchild of Captain Kami, the combined fleet's senior staff officer who sold it to Toyoda. Kusaka disapproved of the idea, and in Fuchida's words, the 5th Air Fleet also was extremely inconvenienced by it. The Naval General Staff took a stand against the project, but gave in because of the extensive authority with regard to operations Toyoda exercised. Four years later, Rear Admiral Sadatoshi Tomioka, former Chief of the Operations Section, Naval General Staff, was still angry about it. Before setting out, the ships refuelled at Tokuyama, taking aboard only enough to reach Okinawa. Kami asked Fuchida to set up fighter escort. The air arm could spare only 36 planes for the job. These had to accompany the ships in increments of nine, going no further out to sea than 100 miles, so they worked in relays, nine fighters for one hour, then another nine. This meagre token did not represent a real escort. Ugaki supplied them at Fuchida's request as a gesture of courtesy and homage to his old friend Ito, the officers and crewmen. They never reached Okinawa. Mitcha had been expecting the move and took all possible precautions. His aircraft appeared over the group around noon on 7 April. Messages from the sorely beset Yamato came to Fuchida at Kanoya, where he was directing the air operation, but he could do nothing to help. The Yamato died hard, taking five 1,000-pound bombs and nine torpedoes before she sank. Despite heroic rescue efforts by the remaining destroyers, 2,498 men went down with her, 446 with the Yahagi, and 721 on the stricken destroyers. Fuchida could not regret that the Yamato met her fate as she did, with guns blazing, invisible token of the Japanese fighting heart. On the very day she went down, Japan installed a new cabinet under the premiership of Baron Kantaro Suzuki, president of the Privy Council. Retired Admiral Suzuki was at the helm, and Yonai was retained as Navy Minister. Ugaki remarked to his diary with grim humour that now that the Navy was without ships, it was going to fight by means of a cabinet. That was not quite the idea. Suzuki, 77 years old, somewhat deaf and vacillating, had been chosen because he fulfilled several basic, though not necessarily compatible, requirements. He must have the absolute trust of the Emperor. This Suzuki did, having served for seven years as Grand Chamberlain. To Suzuki I could pour my heart out, His Majesty confided. The new Premier must not be associated with any extremist group. On the other hand, he could have no visible ties with the underground peace faction. After Suzuki's selection, Kido told him, The Emperor is very deeply concerned over the war trends and desires the attainment of peace at the earliest possible moment. I desire your firm determination on this point, and hope that you will make your cabinet the final war cabinet. Suzuki declared that he was in complete accord with the Emperor's views. That would be his duty if he were to head the government. Unfortunately, Kido did not specify that the attainment of peace meant surrender if necessary. 
As the price of its cooperation, the army presented three demands. The first of these was prosecution of the war to the bitter end. Suzuki replied that he was in complete agreement with the first part. He had little choice. If any suggestion of ending the war leaked out, no one, not even the Prime Minister, would last in office one day. Yonai was racking his brains to find a way to persuade the army to consider peace on any but its own terms. Exactly one month later, Japan had an excellent opportunity to make peace, for on 7 May 1945, Germany surrendered. Tokyo could have salved national pride by pointing out that Japan and Germany had mutually agreed never to seek a separate peace. Even the army had given serious consideration to what the defeat of Germany could mean to Japan. In the spring of 1944, a group of army officers wrote a thesis entitled Measures for the Termination of the Greater East Asia War. Copies of this document, classified as state secrets, were distributed to certain key personnel, among them Fuchida's Etajima classmate, Prince Takamatsu. The war would be ended when Germany is destroyed. Instead of seizing the opportunity, Suzuki issued a statement that the dire change in the European situation will not cause the slightest change here. He had little understanding of the situation. When he offered the portfolio of foreign minister to Shigenori Togo, he agreed that the situation was bad, but said he thought we could keep on fighting two or three years longer. Far down the chain of command, Fuchida had no such illusions. When the Okinawa battle was over, he observed sadly, that was the end of our naval air forces and actually the end of our naval resistance. We paid all, all we had. We fought as best we could with everything we had, and we were proud of our record. Of course it was sad and tragic, and with Okinawa the Japanese Navy was at an end. Japan was reduced to making military fuel from sweet potatoes and tree roots. Under the circumstances, Fuchida told Toyoda and Kusaka they might as well disband the combined fleet. There were no forces left to command. Instead, a top personnel shuffle took place. Ozawa became commander-in-chief. Toyoda moved up to chief of the naval general staff. Rear Admiral Shikazo Yano replaced Kusaka as the fleet's chief of staff, the latter having already departed for Supreme Naval Headquarters as its chief of staff. Captain Mineo Yamaoka became the fleet's senior staff officer, while Fuchida remained as air officer, partly because the army requested it. He had become close friends with Lieutenant Colonel Ryuzo Sejima, the army liaison officer with the combined fleet. So when the reorganization got underway, Sejima asked that the personnel bureau not remove Fuchida, who, Sejima said, was the officer best able to maintain smooth relations with the army. An expert on Russia, Sejima was later stationed in Manchuria, where the Soviets captured him. They took him to Moscow and kept him there for 11 years as the unwilling guest of the Soviet Union. Fuchida didn't want to remain with the combined fleet, piloting a desk in an Alice in Wonderland force of a few ships too damaged to sail, aircraft forbidden to fly, and a waning trickle of kamikazes, the whole running on a combination of vodka and wood alcohol. He had another idea up his sleeve, an attack against the B-29 bases in the Marianas, which he wanted to lead himself. In this bitter period, Fuchida had one cause for thanksgiving. His family remained untouched. They were isolated enough to escape the major attacks. The situation was bad, but close enough to the metropolitan area to see some of the results. Every night we could see the red sky of Tokyo, Miyako remembered. During one bombing, Yoshia became separated from his mother and sister, who were frantic until he showed up none the worse. I hated the war, declared Miyako vehemently. It was so terrible. At Kanoya, U.S. Army planes were so ubiquitous that, as Ugaki wrote, unless we slept in shelters, we could no longer have a sound sleep. We shall have to get back to the primitive life of cavemen. One incident demonstrated how completely the Americans dominated Japan's skies. On the 2nd of June, a Martin flying boat, accompanied by over ten Grumman fighters, flew over Kagoshima Bay, coolly landed on the water, and picked up the crew of a plane shot down that morning. The Japanese army was by no means ready to surrender. It remained a powerful force with enough gas and oil stashed away to put up a good fight against an American invasion. According to Fuchida's estimate, General Gen Sugiyama in Tokyo commanded about two million men, 
and there was a like number in Kyushu under General Shunroku Hata, who established his headquarters at Hiroshima, and they had the first general air force, with headquarters in Osaka and units spread all over the homeland. Acknowledging that the next American move would be an invasion of Japan proper, the armed forces activated Operation Ketsu, which had been planned since the 8th of April 1945. Like Sho and Ten, it was divided into several parts depending on probable landing areas. Primary emphasis was on Ketsu No. 6 and Ketsu No. 3. In general, the plan estimated that Kyushu would be the initial target. If this proved to be the case, some army officers were absolutely sure of victory. It was the first and only battle in which the main strength of the air, land and sea forces were to be joined. The geographical advantages of the homeland were to be utilised to the highest degree, the enemy was to be crushed, and we were confident that the battle would prove to be a turning point in political manoeuvring. Others were not so sure. In the words of Lieutenant General Toroshiro Kawabe, we never anticipated that the homeland decisive battle would lead to victory. It was a step Japan and the Japanese armed forces had to take in order to maintain their prestige. To this end, the army was prepared to see the whole nation go down in flames. Army leaders adopted the slogan, 100 million die for the country, and called up every able-bodied man. The army also wanted control of the tattered remains of the navy. As of the 1st of July, the navy had approximately 5,000 planes of all types, of which some 3,500 were operational. Of this figure, only 600 or so were flyable fighters. Moreover, the ersatz fuel held down speed. With the slightly macabre humour the fighting man can summon in the most unlikely situations, the navy called Ketsu Okatonbe Sakusen, after a slow-crawling red insect. The only real use headquarters still had for Fuchida was to pick his brains for the best way to utilise the remaining aircraft. The army maintained its general headquarters slightly south of Osaka, so for greater ease of communication with his opposite number, Ozawa moved combined fleet headquarters from Tokyo to Yamato, near Osaka, and only ten miles from the border of Nara, Fuchida's own province. Some even suggested that the emperor and the government move to this area if the enemy invaded Tokyo. Ozawa ordered all sailors to marine status, issued them rifles and bayonets, and put them under army command. Commander Masataka Chihaya joined Ozawa's staff to help organise them. A fine officer, full of courage and good sense, Chihaya was the brother of Fuchida's Pearl Harbour friend lost in the Marianas. These instant marines had no choice but to go along with the proposition, but their hearts weren't in it. Like their superior officers, they were fed up with the army. As Fuchida saw it, the navy had carried most of the load in the Pacific War. Now the army, with its unspent resources and manpower in the homeland, wanted to squeeze the last drop out of the exhausted navy. Along with Ketsu, and an essential part of it, went Seisakusen, which the army conducted from Osaka to command the skies over the homeland. Fuchida had no confidence in Sei. He couldn't visualise any possible way Japan's fighters would halt the B-29s, not to mention American carrier aircraft, once they reached the main islands. In his opinion, the only way to stop enemy bombers effectively was to hit them before they started. This was the idea behind Operation Ken which Fuchida worked on in secret, lest his army colleagues find out about it and mess it up. Ken called for aircraft to land on the B-29 strips in the Marianas. Their men of a special landing force would jump out, run to the nearest B-29, attach a special short-fused bomb to its wing, and try to race away before the bomb exploded. Of course, the mission meant almost certain death for all the air commandos, how had an otherwise sane naval officer with a reputation for down-to-earth thinking come to consider such an idea? To our knowledge, though Fuchida didn't mention the fact, there was a precedent. On the night of 24 May 11 army bombers, each carrying 11 men of the Gretsu, a special attack unit, left Kumamoto. Only one succeeded in landing at Okinawa. Its men erupted from the plane, tossing phosphorescent bombs and hand grenades. They managed to destroy or damage a number of planes, blow up fuel pumps and kill a few of the defenders before the latter emerged from the confusion to kill every one of the Japanese. Whether or not inspired by this example, Ozawa approved Fuchida's plan. Training for Ken began at air bases in Hokkaido with a force of 40 Douglas transports and 400 men. 
These figures of Fuchida's don't coincide with those of his colleague, Commander Yoshimori Terai, who recalled Ken as requiring 25 medium attack planes and 250 men of the Special Naval Landing Force. He agreed, however, that the object was to land on the B-29 bases in the Marianas and destroy the planes. It was to be a night attack during the moonlight period after the middle of July. Misawa Airfield in northern Honshu was to be used as the base for this attack. However, an American task force attacked this base of departure on 14 and 15 July, and the bombers which were to be used in Operation Ken were lost on the 14th. Thus, the plan for the Mariana attack had to be abandoned. It is possible that more than one Ken was planned, for according to Admiral Morrison on 31 July Halsey, once more in command with his third fleet, ordered Task Force 38 to the waters off northern Honshu to wipe out Japanese aircraft. This was a concentration of 200 bombers scheduled to crash land at B-29 bases with 2,000 suicide troops. As late as the beginning of August, Fuchida had not abandoned his pet project, the nature of which spoke volumes for the desperation of Japan's defenders. Telephone for you, sir. Fuchida seized the instrument thankfully, glad of any break in the boredom of the past few days in Hiroshima. Urgent business has come up between the Army and Navy in connection with the Army's base at Kashiwara. It was Admiral Yano, the Navy's Chief of Staff. Ozawa is coming to Yamato soon in anticipation of Operation Ketsu, and arrangements are underway to consolidate Kashiwara Army Base and Yamato Navy Base. Unless you are urgently needed at Hiroshima, both the engineering men and I want you back at Yamato. Fuchida glanced at his watch. The hands touched fourteen, plenty of time to fly to Yamato before nightfall. I'll leave as soon as possible, he answered. I am not at all important here. I have lost interest in this army operation. He was one of a dozen navy officers the army had invited to Hiroshima in the latter part of July, as observers of a planning conference in preparation for Operation Sei. Despite the urgency of the subject, Fuchida couldn't work up an interest in the conference. His mind occupied with his own problems, he had little thought to spare for the Sei discussions, which were quite technical, particularly in the field of communications. As most of the other Navy observers were experts in that area, they didn't need his assistance. He was restless. He itched to return to work on Ken, still hoping to realise his scheme of destroying B-29s at their bases in the Marianas. Coming as it did on the heels of an unproductive luncheon meeting, Yano's phone call was welcome. As soon as he hung up, he paid a courtesy farewell call at General Hutter's headquarters, gathered his gear from the Yamato Hotel, which housed most of the Navy delegation, and headed for the Hiroshima airfield. At about 17, he climbed into a Navy three-seater and flew alone to Yamato, arriving at 19. The day was Sunday, the 5th of August, 1945. At about eight the next morning, a train from Kura ground to a halt at the Hiroshima station. Lieutenant Hashimoto, a communications officer who had been commuting between the conference and his home in Kura some twelve miles to the south, swung leisurely down the train steps and made his way to the underground restroom. He had just begun freshening up when he felt a violent shock and shaking as of a major earthquake. He hurried back to the surface to see what had happened. He emerged from the station in what he later described as another world, strange and weird. As far as his eye could see, Hiroshima sprawled in a ghastly expanse of smoking ruins and blackened corpses. The shock of this break between his normal routine and the nightmarish sight was too much for Hashimoto to bear. With a protesting whimper, he turned and fled down the railroad tracks in mindless flight from this city of the dead. As he stumbled down the tracks, his body absorbed radiation at every step. At the Yamato Hotel, six Navy officers enjoying an early breakfast were blasted into infinity. Two others, still in bed, partially protected by their futons, escaped the blast, but not the radiation. They lived a miserable six months before death released them at Kura Naval Hospital. General Hutter, who with a number of army officers lived in an underground bomb shelter, survived the bombing uninjured. Hashimoto ran for a mile and a half before his reason returned. He came to his senses in a small suburb called Kaidichi. Panting convulsively, he stopped at the station and tried to arrange his thoughts. Conscience-stricken at having run away, he hurried to the nearest telephone booth and called the Kura Naval Station. 
All Hiroshima is destroyed by a new powerful bomb, he announced. Everyone is dead. This was the dramatic story he later told to Fuchida in the Navy hospital. As the Kura base had a double telephone hookup with General Headquarters in Tokyo and with Ozawa in Hiyoshi, both received word at the same time when Kura relayed Hashimoto's message. Yano telephoned Fuchida at his office at the Yamato base. Hiroshima has been completely destroyed by a powerful new bomb, he said, his voice heavy with the weight of his message. All are dead. Fuchida sat and stared blankly at the telephone receiver. The bustling city he had left only the previous afternoon completely destroyed, the men with whom he had lunched that day all dead, and with them the population of the city. For a moment his mind refused to accept what his ears had heard. He sat in a state of shock. Meanwhile, Yano's voice continued to pour out of the phone, giving a detailed description of the extent and type of damage. As best he could determine, in an instant, a single explosion had blasted Hiroshima and most if not all of its people. What do you think of this new bomb? Yano asked as if from an infinite distance. This must be the atomic bomb, Fuchida answered mechanically. Yes, I guess so. Fuchida thought hard and fast. Japan had no time to waste in lamentation. It must seize from this frightful event whatever it could turn to advantage. In flattening Hiroshima, the United States had given Japan the opportunity to acknowledge defeat with dignity. It had also taken upon itself the responsibility to end the war promptly. Japan should sue for peace at once, Fuchida told Yano. Please go straight to the naval general staff and pressure them to act. As he hung up, he thought to himself dully, the war is over. Not everyone jumped as rapidly as Fuchida to the conclusion that the Americans had dropped an atomic bomb, both the Navy and Army had been studying the possibility of such a weapon for several years. The Army's effort centred on the Physical and Chemical Research Institute under Dr. Yoshio Nishina. Lieutenant General Toroshiro Kawabe, then Chief of the Army Aeronautical Department, had assigned several of his young technical officers to research atomic energy with Nishina. In late 1944, when Kawabe visited the Institute, he received the impression that the research work was still in an embryo stage. On that occasion, someone, he didn't remember who told him that in America, research on atomic energy seemed to be in an advanced stage. Then, in June 1945, after he had become assistant chief of the Army General Staff, he learned that research into atomic energy would be postponed because the very critical war situation made it necessary that we concentrate all endeavours on the imminent decisive battle for the homeland. Nishina blamed Japan's failure to develop atomic energy on such factors as the small number of scientists qualified in that area and lack of industrial power to follow up theoretical findings. Even if Japan could have overcome those handicaps, it lacked uranium ore. An air raid on 13 April 1945 raised his laboratory, a major setback. The constant air raids forced the Army's aeronautical department to move out of Tokyo, so close liaison was no longer possible. However, he received no definite order to suspend his research. As mentioned, not everyone agreed that what had exploded over Hiroshima was an atomic bomb. Immediately after that event, the Atomic Bomb Countermeasure Committee was formed in Suzuki's cabinet. Sumihisa Ikeda, chief of the cabinet planning board, was chairman. Members included representatives of the War, Navy and Home Ministries and the Technical Board. The committee held its first meeting on the 7th of August, at which time the technical board representatives strongly insisted that the bomb was not an atomic bomb. They reasoned, no matter how advanced American technique may be, it is quite impossible for the Americans to bring such unstable weapons as atomic devices to Japan across the Pacific. We do not know what will happen in the future, but to date American technique is not that highly developed. In America, the president has announced that it was an atomic bomb, Ikeda rejoined. I can hardly imagine that Americans would broadcast such a lie. If it is not an atomic bomb, what is it? The reply came somewhat lamely. It must be a new type bomb with special equipment, but its content is unknown. This difference of opinion was why the first official announcement didn't contain the word atomic. When Lieutenant General Shuichi Miyazaki, Chief of the Operations Division, Army Department of the Imperial General Staff, received instructions on the phraseology to be used in the announcement, 
they included an explanation that ran somewhat like this. Although it appears to be an atomic bomb, it is too premature to formally decide. Therefore, we will announce it as a special bomb and wait for a final finding of the field investigation. Nishina encountered the same resistance at Tokorozawa on his way to investigate Hiroshima on the spot. Although information was still fragmentary and scanty, from the accounts he had received the scientist had little doubt what had happened. However, the general opinion in the military circles held that Truman's announcement that the bomb was an atomic weapon was probably a propaganda to scare the Japanese. Grassroots instinct, however, outran official caution. The government announced only a powerful bomb, but people already knew the atomic bomb had come, Fuchida recalled. People always know things like that. Fuchida had distinguished support for his assessment that Japan should sue for peace and lose no time about it. The emperor was overwhelmed with grief and commanded Kido, Under these circumstances we must bow to the inevitable. No matter what happens to my safety, we must put an end to this war as speedily as possible so that this tragedy will not be repeated. Others were neither so sensitive nor so realistic. Ugaki admitted in his diary that the bomb was a real wonder, making the outcome of the war more gloomy. But he added, we must think of some countermeasures against it immediately, and at the same time I wish we could create the same bomb. Fuchida didn't have long to muse over the situation. The Navy hastily gathered a group to go to Hiroshima and investigate the bombing. Fuchida would meet the others at Hata's headquarters about noon the next day. The other nine officers set out by transport plane from Atsugi near Tokyo. The officer in charge of the group turned out to be Captain Yasui Yasukado, with whom Fuchida had gone to middle school in Nara Prefecture. The rest of the investigators were engineers, not Etajima men. Fuchida was not acquainted with any of them. Yasukado was a bacteriologist as well as an expert on poison gas. He and his engineers had some idea of the hazards of radiation, but Fuchida knew nothing at all concerning the subject. None took precautions. They walked into Hiroshima the day after the atomic bomb exploded with nothing more on their backs than uniforms. Their mission was to estimate the extent of the damage and to figure out details about the flight that had dropped the bomb, the altitude at which the bomb had exploded, and so forth. They walked around the city. There was no transportation of any kind. The destruction was dreadful beyond imagination and telling. People wandered about in a daze, some badly burned, others half out of their minds, others poking in the ashes as if seeking something, however hopelessly. It was like an evil nightmare, Fuchida summed it up. Along the rivers and canals that traversed the city, bodies were piled six and seven feet high. Most people not killed instantly sought water to ease their excruciatingly painful burns, but the water itself was hot, and multitudes died either in the canals, in the rivers, or along their banks. Not a speck of cool green remained. Every tree had burned in fires that still smoked and flared. To add to the misery, a fearsome black rain began to fall. Black raindrops formed black pools and stained black every stone, nature spreading a funeral pall over the stricken city. Survivors to whom Fuchida talked were bitterly angry and shocked that the United States would resort to such measures. Fuchida himself felt no hatred or resentment, nor in the future would he have any patience with those who tried to saddle the United States with guilt. That was war, he explained simply. His professional training had taught him that in war any kind of destruction should be expected. He added honestly, if Japan had had the atomic bomb, we would have dropped it on the United States. What is more, Fushida, as air operations officer of the combined feet, would have been responsible for dropping it in the Marianas, in the Philippines, or even against the continental United States if he had been able to reach it. He would have been willing, even proud, to strike such a devastating blow for his country, he spent the night in General Hutter's underground shelter. The next day he heard a rumour that another atomic bomb had been dropped, landing near the city without exploding. This called for immediate investigation. His group scoured the outskirts of Hiroshima. Somewhat north of the city they saw a strange object in a field. Fuchida and Yasukado, looking it over from a distance through their binoculars, couldn't identify it. Finally they summoned up courage to approach it. They discovered the mysterious bundle to be the parachute that had carried the Hiroshima bomb. 
It still contained a radio, which Fuchida thought might have been a timing device.